Hi, my name is Brandon Boyd, and I sing and songwrite in the band Incubus. My name's Amelia Meath. I'm in the band Sylvanesso and Mountain Man and the A's. Hi, I'm Holly, and this is Jess, and we are um, singers in a band called Lucius. My name is Ken Scott. I am a recording engineer, record producer, author, and uh, lecturer. Wow, David Bowie has had uh, an indelible effect on me and all of the guys in my band. Um, we all were born in um, the mid 70s. So I was born in 1976. So to say that he has been a big part of my life would be a pretty massive understatement. Um, I remember the first time I heard David Bowie, the first handful of times, I was probably too young to understand fully what was happening, but I remember first being like cognizant of his music. And um, I remember it confusing me a little bit. And as I got a little bit older, I've come to understand that that's a wonderful thing to be perplexed by art that someone is making. And then it sort of draws you in and you kind of have a desire to understand more deeply um, where they're coming from. So I guess that's a good place to start. I think I first heard, this is going to be embarrassing and it's going to show my age, but I think I, I was listening to the Clueless soundtrack in the car, which had a cover of all the young dudes on it. I think, or maybe it was that song. And I remember it was like the prompt for my dad to show me Bowie for the very first time. So we went to the Strawberries in Cambridge, Massachusetts and got Ziggy Stardust and a couple of other records. And that was like when my full introduction to Bowie began on a ride from Boston to New Hampshire. Um, I think the moment when I, uh, when I personally became involved with Bowie d beyond the like understanding the rock and roll history of him was after I'd become a professional musician and I heard the song Sound and Vision, mm -hmm. which so beautifully describes the nature of trying to write a song by yourself in such a like, it feels like a beautiful little like magical kind of like birthday song that you can sing to yourself as you sit down to begin the work that I do or that most of us do. Um, and it kind of, it became like a little songwriting candle for me. For me, I have always been a huge Bowie fan. I, this is also gonna show my age, but the, for my introduction to Bowie was, I was the baby of the mid eighties and, um, my sister, my older sister was obsessed with Labyrinth. And so it was like always on in my house. I got to know the soundtrack, like the back of my hand. And that was some of the first music um, in my life. And then from there, I was like, oh, I, I need to know more. This is like freaky and creepy, but also so, you know, enticing. And so then I got into Hunky Dory after that and Hunky Dory and the Darum recordings, and they had like such a childlike humor to them and just like a, a freedom to them that mm -hmm. I was so attracted to. And, and then Ziggy Stardust came a little bit later when I was a little bit more angsty. And I grew up in a small suburban area of Cleveland, Ohio. And I, you know, David Bowie was like my escape from this mundane sort of life and uh and he was my way out of there so so yeah that was and still is you know <laughs> there's like so many records hit you at different times in your life it's it's wild but and and just to continue from there uh, you know it was he uh life on mars was one of the first songs we ever sang together it was it was him who really like connected us and we're a very visual band. Uh, my mom is a visual artist. I grew up in Los Angeles. Actually, I went to your high school, Brandon. Oh, really? <laughs> and so I, um, 
I was always really inspired by visual art and it was always um, that which then became theater. There was always a connection, those worlds to me and to um, my voice. Like I always needed some, um, I always saw what I was hearing. I always um, painted like a picture to whatever it was that we were doing sonically or even as a young kid, what was going on for me sonically. So. Um, when I was introduced to Bowie and I, you know, I can't remember the very moment. I just remember my mom showing me a video. I, I think it was like his Saturday night live performance, honestly, um, where he was like, almost like a, pro there was a projection of a body on him. It was quite, um, forward thinking and technically savvy for the time. I remember mm -hmm. that, um, and I just was um, so blown away by how theatrical and visual um, his world was. And then in exploring that more, um, how, how that continued and how that evolved and how every record was, took a completely different landscape. It was a completely different planet. And um, that's always inspired me. I, I know it's inspired us in, in what we do very, very much probably. Um, the premier artist of our, um, in, in, you know, inspiration. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Okay, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> uh, talk about showing one's age. I happen to co-produce the Ziggy Stardust album along with three other of David's albums. I think the first time I heard him was uh, probably on the terrible English radio uh, at the time, and it was a song called The Laughing Gnome. Yeah. And he was That's a right. bit of a joke at that point. <laughs> the next time I would have heard him would have been Space Oddity, because I had, I had started off working at Abbey Road Studios. And for one reason or another, uh, I left there and went to work at a studio called Trident. And very soon after I started there, uh, one Saturday afternoon, this artist came in, who happened to be David Bowie, and he recorded a track uh, called Space Oddity. And I heard it when I went in on Monday and loved it. Subsequent to that, I was asked to uh, engineer the rest of the album. Then I did work on Man Who Sold The World. Uh, it was The basic tracks were recorded in another studio. Then they came in for overdubs and mixing. Then David asked me to co-produce with him. And I'd never co-produced. I'd never produced anything before. I'd just been the engineer. And for some obscure reason, I said yes. And uh, that, out of that came Hunky Dory. And from there on, an amazing, an amazing life. Mm. Mm -hmm. I guess because he's really created a world so distinct for every record. I was curious if he had a strong um, idea going in to the record making process of what it would sound like and what it would look like, what kind of world he would be creating. Uh, I, I, yes, he did. Uh, to a point, one of the greatest things with, with David was his ability to put together a team that would give him exactly what he was after without having to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, on, on Hunky Dory, Ziggy and Aladdin Sane, the, the only change within the team was on the first, on Hunky Dory, it was Rick Wakeman playing piano because it needed to be more classically oriented. The next one, Ziggy was uh, more rock and roll. So it, it was uh, they, just David Orono would play piano. And then, then he picked up Mike Garson during the American tour. And got and he brought out a whole other side with the avant-garde piano and everything. But I remember with with Garson, he when we came to the Aladdin Sane solo, he started off he playing he was playing quite straight, and David said no play what you would normally play. He did it again and he was playing fairly straight, and David said no play what you would normally play. And he said are you serious? He said yes go with it. And what he played that one time is is the solo and it was just uh -huh. it blew us all away that was exactly what David wanted it worked perfectly so yeah he he had an idea the last time I worked with David it was doing a couple of 
a, a couple of songs from the Diamond Dogs album, which he'd put together. It was 19, uh, 1984 slash Dodo. And it was one of the few mixes that David came along to. And all the time we were trying to mix it, he kept on putting on albums and it, they all had the Philadelphia sound, like from Barry White to all of those kind of things. And he kept on saying, I want it to sound like that. I want it to sound like that. And of course, it never did because we worked with the English musicians. I was mm -hmm. English. It was never going to sound the way those did. He finished up going over to America and uh, putting the team together, which gave him young Americans. And he got exactly what he wanted at that point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he knew what he wanted. Mm -hmm. He didn't always know how to get there. Mm -hmm. Did, um, because Hunky Dory and um, Ziggy Stardust were kind of written, recorded almost on, on top of each other, right? Like, mm -hmm. and some of the songs like It Ain't Easy and Lady Stardust to me sound kind of Hunky Dory-esque. Were, were there crossover songs or were, like, how did you pick which songs go on which record? Well, It Ain't Easy was originally recorded for Hunky Dory. Okay. And we just didn't use it. We had too much material, so it was put to one side, and we just, just decided to use it for Ziggy. Uh, I always <laughs> think that, that, like people say, how, the, the big difference between Hunky Dory and Ziggy Stardust, I always just bring up, uh, of course, I immediately, <laughs> Queen Bitch, that's it, oh, yeah. which is so, that would have fitted in with, with Ziggy perfectly. It was much yeah. heavier. It's... Uh, we picked, we just did the songs and put them together that, that seemed to fit together for Hunky Dory and then exactly the same for, for Ziggy. And yes, they were recorded very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was, uh, he. I saw him walking along the corridor about a couple of weeks after we recorded Hunky Dory. He still didn't have a record deal at this point, mm -hmm. but his management wanted him to do another album just to get a bigger and better record deal. And he told me that uh, you're not going to like this one. I said, why? And he said, it's, it's, it's going to be more rock and roll. And he said, I want, I want it to be more, and I can't remember if, if he said uh, Iggy Pop or Velvet Underground. It didn't matter because I didn't know who they were at that point, either of them. So it didn't really make much difference. But he was wrong. I did like it. And we, we did quite well with it. We all liked it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm racking my brain. Uh, I have so many questions running around in my head, but there's something that's kind of rising to the fore, and I I hope it's not too personal. And and please be honest if it is too personal. But I'm so curious about um, artists in general and how artists work and our, the process of making music and making art has always been something that I've been deeply enamored by and it's why I keep kind of like chasing the rabbit, so to speak, because I, I love the feeling of magic that kind of overtakes an entire room when you get into that flow state. But so many artists, especially some of like these seminal artists, um, get reputations of being kind of like insufferable pricks when they get <laughs> into creative environments. And so my question is, uh, what was it like working with him in these environments? I know in the environments that we've, created around incubus and in my solo stuff it's it's like 98 percent joy like we go back and we show up every day because it's a joyous process and when someone starts getting into a mood it's like go home dude come back when you're feeling better you know and so i'm i'm curious if what, what was it like working with him it, it was a joy it, it, every day that look as far as i'm concerned that's the best drug in the world it's having the musicians in the studio creating mm -hmm. i sit back at the board with my feet up on it just having this incredible music waft over me it's Amazing. there's nothing else quite like it yeah. uh we're always chasing the, the the rabbit i think all of us are trying to that next thing we're always after the next thing mm -hmm. uh Working with, with David during that, it was always, a, as I said, a joy. It was mm. exceedingly professional, but we had a hell of a lot of fun doing it. And mm. re remember, we were together for very short periods of time in the studio because back then, artists had to come up with an album, one album every six months. So mm -hmm. we, we took two weeks to record Hunky Dory. We took two weeks plus two days to do Space uh, to do uh, Starman. Uh, for, really? for Ziggy Stardust. And then it was two weeks recording, then I'd mix. And uh, on, on all of them, it was basically the same. Uh, so yeah. it, it was all quick. Yes, there would be the occasional 
touchy moment, but they were so few and far between and over with very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Of course it is. Yeah. Uh, and no, it, it was it was astounding. Mm -hmm. I love hearing that. Thank you so much. Okay. Mm -hmm. one, one other thing. He got bored in the studio. Mm -hmm. Hence, mm -hmm. that's why he didn't come along to mix this, because keep on hearing the same thing time and time again would have driven him crazy. Mm -hmm. And everyone in the studio knew that they had to get the take very quickly. Otherwise, he'd just say, it's not working. Let's move on to something else. Mm -hmm. So everyone mm -hmm. else was on edge. He and probably myself were the only ones that weren't on edge. Mm -hmm. I relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, Ken, when... First of all, it's really lovely to just get to ask you questions. Thank you so much for giving us this time. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. I love doing it. I give lectures around the world now, and some of them just about David. And mm -hmm. it, it's the, the best part for me is always the Q&A at the end, because mm -hmm. it's, I get asked questions that I, have, I wouldn't even have thought of. So it, it's mm -hmm. having to come up with the answers. I love it. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm curious about the track listing of this album when you were recording it were you talking about the track listing was that something that you were involved in as a co-producer or was was that like something that was just determined by labels at that time the processes have changed so much from then to now that labels had nothing whatsoever to do with any of the records we made except for one thing and that was when we had it in ziggy uh in where Starman finished up, we'd done a cover of Chuck Berry's Round and Round. So we gave that to RCA. They came back saying they didn't hear a single. We, they needed a single. So we went back into the studio, two days recorded Starman and put it in place of Round and Round. That was the only time the record company said anything about the records. Mm. So oh. that, that they had nothing. To, it was so great. I didn't start having uh, A&R guys and record companies involved until the mid 80s. That's when they really started to come in and really? push their weight around. Them. <laughs> really? uh, yeah. So with regard to the running order, I have been asked about it before, and I honestly can't remember. I know that at that time, both before that, as just as the engineer and moving into the engineering production side of things, because we, we had to have fairly equal a number of minutes on each side of the album and really you didn't want it to go over max like 22 minutes if you wanted it loud I would constantly be sitting there as we were recording something I'd have all the times of the tracks and I'd be going through well these ones would work together and these these would give an equal time and where, what we could swap and all of that kind of thing mm. how we finished up with the final running order I honestly can't remember I do know that the, the one thing that I was very dictatorial about, if, if for want of a better way of describing it, was, was the timing within the tracks. When I first started at uh, Abbey Road, when it was EMI Recording Studios, one of the things that we had to do was we'd be getting albums in from the States and we would have to put exactly five seconds between each track. And that drove me nuts because sometimes you want something to come in. It feels as if it should come in quicker. Sometimes it needs a long break just to ah, come down. Mm -hmm. So I was very specific when, when it came to uh, the running order. I tried to keep everything in tempo. Mm. So even if, it, even if it's a different tempo, your foot still comes down on the downbeat mm. into the next song. Mm -hmm. And that that work for that that I know I take full credit for that. As far as the run, as far as the running order, I we must have been talking about it, but I have no, I it's 50 years ago. I really don't have a recollection of how it all came together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's five seconds. That feels like an eternity. I know. It's it was too long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was two and a half times the width of the tape machine. That must have oh. been leader. That has something to do with the way that uh the space between grooves on vinyl, right? Well, like to some kind of it, it, was, yeah. it didn't have to be like that, but that's right. what was determined by standard the hier hierarchy. Oh, oh, also, Ken, were you were you um, a kind of engineer that wore a white coat? Was that in the era of that's white coat complete wearing? rubbish? <laughs> oh, it's lies. <laughs> no, look. Okay, I've never heard that. The, 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 the way it went, we had. Uh, a, one group that was there were 
I, ca I call them the, the studio roadies. They were, they were there to set up large orchestras, to s help drummers bring in their kits and all of that. And they would wear brown lab coats. So they were the brown oh. coats. The technical engineers, the, the electronic engineers, the whizzes, they would wear white coats because mm. they were the ones that would put out all of the dusty cables and all of that kind of thing, because we weren't allowed to touch. We, were, we didn't set up sessions. Mm -hmm. The electronic mm -hmm. whizzes had to set it up. Mm -hmm. Then finally we'd go down and we could move the mics into position. But they, they were dealing with all of these dirty cables. They were going into the uh, echo chambers, which were disgusting in there. They were filthy. And mm. they didn't want, we had to wear suits, suits and ties. So they didn't want to get their suits dirty. So they wore white lab coats. <laughs> the engineers had to wear suits and ties the entire time. Um, so yes, there were white coats, but not the, not the, not the recording engineers, not, not the balance engineers. Mm. It was the electronics engineers that did. Totally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is all super new to me. I wasn't aware of the, the white coat, brown coat phenomenon. Was that, was that a, a, a UK thing or is that kind of industry standard everywhere? Oh no, it, it, it was, it was, it was EMI. It was Abbey Road. It was, right. uh, that was just at that time. Look, we, we yeah. weren't that far out of the war. It was, uh, and it was still very Victorian and uh, just, it, it yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I started at the beginning of when teens realized their power mm -hmm. and we started to take over and it was perfect. It was great. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm I'm so fascinated by the I think maybe it's because I'm like a student of pop music, but also just a like a track listing nerd. And the fact that so to me, this album in some ways there every song is very important, but like it really starts to cook on the B side in this interesting way to me. But the five years is like a harbinger of things to come. And basically the way it like rolls out the red carpet to the record and is like guess what everything's in here yeah <laughs> and and like you have you you're like for me re-listening to, to it today which like so much of this record is like like it's part of my blood so I like hear it but honestly you know I downloaded it off Napster none of the titles have ever been a thing for me and like being able to like put all of the it was like listening to it in order again felt like I was getting like bits of a collage that I had like known for the entirety of my life, like being like in fast relief immediately appearing in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what five years has always felt like to me. It's like, it's a, it's like a glorious Pandora's box parade, literally like unfurling before you. And also it's so like, and, and the, everyone's mad which I love. <laughs> okay. I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I'm just yeah. going to mostly defer to your comment. Like it is such an incredible opener. It is like opening Pandora's box, the harbinger of <laughs> so much amazing goodness to come. Um, you took all the words right out of my mouth. So thank you. That was well said. <laughs> I guess my question would be like, what did it, because it crescendos. It, yeah. It's exactly what, you're saying it just like builds and builds into this whole what did that look like a lot in the studio I mean was it everyone in with the strings and like how, how no, what did it, it, look like? it, it, it was done a piece at a time it, it was uh -huh. that if I remember well I think it was uh, acoustic guitar bass and drums would have been laid down first mm -hmm. then we would have started uh, overdubs uh, orchestra going on almost last uh, with one of Rono's amazing uh, arra string arrangements, orchestra orchestral arrangements. The, the thing for me about uh, five years, well, one of the things about David was he was the ultimate studio performer. Mm -hmm. Of the, the four albums that I co-produced with him, 90% of the vocals were one take, beginning to end, the first take. Wow. I would roll the tape a little just to get the, the sound and the, the level, go back, hit record. And what he did that one time through is what we still hear today. Wow. 95% of the tracks. Now on five years, 
by the time we got to the end, he had tears pouring down his face. He was so emotional about it, mm -hmm. just crying like you wouldn't believe. And just sitting up there in the control room with, with that going on downstairs was just it's the greatest drug in the world. What were mm. you saying? Yeah, I had, uh, it was amazing. I was hoping that you were going to touch on that around like the, the performance aspect oh, of, of this work yeah. because so much of that has been kind of siphoned out of album making over the last mm -hmm. 15, mm -hmm. 20 years or so as we've gotten you know further and further into the age of digital recording. If I can just make two quick points. One, technology is great. The problem mm -hmm. is us. We tend to, we have to overuse everything. Yeah. yeah. So we, yeah. We, could, we could still record Ziggy in exactly the same way, just using 16 tracks of Pro mm -hmm. Tools or whatever door you want to use. Mm -hmm. it, it's, and the other thing, uh, going back to, uh, to Amelia, the, the, the whole thing of the, the streaming, download, mm -hmm. it's, I, I don't like the fact that it's single tracks. Mm -hmm. We I used know. to make albums to be a, a, a concept, not a concept album, but to be heard from beginning to end, mm -hmm. to take yeah. you to different places. And that, that's what it was all about back then. It wasn't about individual tracks. So mm. when, when, you, when people stream and it's just this track and then you'll hear a track from someone else and eventually you might hear another track from the album. To mm. me, it ruins the entire thing. It, you should be able to listen to the album in its entirety, but that doesn't mm -hmm. happen very often now. So uh, the Moon Age Daydream was uh, another one of the, the great Mick Ronson arrangements, uh, orchestral arrangements. And one of the things that uh, I, I said earlier about David forming a team that would give him exactly what he wanted. A, a classic example is the, uh, the guitar solo at the end of Moon Age Daydream where Rono just goes off. And we, mm. we didn't even have to tell him what to do. It was just, okay, it's time to do the end. Okay, I'll go down. He went down and he did it. Boom, that was it. Uh, that, that's, the, that's the way it worked then. We, we were almost in each other's heads and we, we knew what had to happen. And that, going back on something else, whether David knew what he wanted, there was the, the, the solo on Moon Age Daydream, which is a baritone sax and a recorder playing mm -hmm. octaves apart. And David kind of knew what he wanted. There, there was, uh, I can't remember, it was late 50s or early 60s song uh, by the Hollywood Argyles uh, that was called show, show Know A Lot About Love. It was the, it was the B side of one of their hits. And in, going through it all the way was this line, which was played by a baritone and a, fl and a flute, octaves apart. And David loved that sound. So he wanted that sound for the solo. So that's what we did. It was a baritone, but David played, uh, played recorder because no one could play flute. So mm. that's what we did. He, he knew exactly what he wanted for that solo. Mm. I love a practical use of the recorder. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I seem to be drawn to that. I've, done it, I've recorded it so many times. It's so much fun. It's yeah. also just the squeakiest little sound. It's yep. one, of my, one of my absolute favorites. <laughs> I, I kept on being struck while I was listening to this record, and this is more of a comment on the song and the lyrics in general. I love how so many of the so many of the songs begin with a, the description of who the singer is and so many of them include contradictions like i'm a like i'm a mama papa coming for you or like there are so many different instances mm -hmm. of like of being two dualities which mm -hmm. is so fascinating to me particularly because the character of ziggy stardust is such like a true queer icon being mm -hmm. able to I'm also wondering, like, how, why do we always know, like, this was before music videos. Why, why, or I think it was, right? Were there? Yeah, were, basically. Yeah. There, there like, was the odd thing. But there was the odd MTV, thing. But, MTV hadn't started yet. Well, yeah. But, like, the, like, the presence, the physical presence of the, of Ziggy Stardust as a creature is so available to, like, yeah. You know, like the minute you hear the record, you know who's singing it and you know who we, who this like, this person is, which I'm so amazed by in that like, 
here's this very dramatic wild record. And at the center of it is this like wild conductor that we're all so deeply familiar with, but actually you never really get to see him very often. But you almost like the only know what it looks like. It's already just yeah. the sonic presentation and the way he's describing himself and even the way he bends his voice to like, I don't know. I mean, he's creating a character. I, I was curious about that too, like how much of it was just this thing that was already imagined or if it was created as he was going, which I mean, both would be fascinating. I'm just, you know, curious. My, my, my suspicion, because I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is it, it came about as we went along. Mm -hmm. uh, David certainly didn't look like Ziggy when we were recording. It, it mm -hmm. started to, to, to come along. And it, it was, look, when, when David and I started Hunky Dory as co-producers, we had never done anything quite like it before. We'd never produced before. So we went into it with some trepidation. And as, as we made decisions and, and things started to come together, it was, this is working, this is happening, it's great. And that gave us confidence to push the envelope a bit more. And that continued through through Ziggy, through Aladdin Sane. And one of the, one of the great things about Bowie was his his courage, much the much like the Beatles. It was I'm going to make the record I want to make. I don't care what anyone else says. And so mm -hmm. that that and not wanting it to be the same every time. Uh, and that that takes a tremendous amount of courage if you have success. Too many times the artist management wants it, record company wants it. They want to re recreate the same one that was a hit before. They want mm. to protect the success as opposed yes. to the artistry. Yes. Mm. yes, which David, no, it was always to hell with it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that's mm. why he, that's why he's so amazing. Just how far he covered during, during his, his career. Mm. And it, that, that came across with Ziggy, especially pushing the boundary. It, it, I, it's funny because I don't see, the, the, I, I know the effect that he had on people. I don't totally understand it. Like the, the way the Top of the Pops star man broke him in, in England completely, that, that was, and so many artists have said, it completely changed my life. Mm. Now, the thing that's always brought up is him putting his arm around Rono. Mm. I, he was a friend. You do sometimes put your arm around your mate. It's, it's that kind of thing. But for, for whatever reason, it took on a whole other connotation, mm -hmm. which David would always, he would push. Yeah. He, he, knew, he was good at the promotion. He knew what to do there. And so when things started to come up, it, it, he would, yeah, he would push it that much further. There's something that I'm struck by in listening to you talk about that. And as well as everyone else's comments just now is something that, David seems to have um, in surplus was uh, almost like an otherworldly confidence. And I don't, I never knew him, unfortunately. I, I did see him perform a couple of times, but that was what struck me every time I saw him perform um, was he would walk onto stage and there was no question in his mind that he was exactly where he was supposed to be. And I have a sense that maybe he was like that for most of his like career. I just never seen anything like it. Like I remember, um, it's such a random story, but I, I used to hang out in Venice Beach when I was a teenager, and I would um, sit in like drum circles on the sand with all the mm -hmm. other dirty hippie people. And uh, I remember once, mm -hmm. one summer, late summer, moving into fall, I was with my then girlfriend, and we were playing our 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 drums, and this random person walked up to us and said. Hey, do you guys want to come and play drums at David Bowie's Halloween ball at the Palladium in Los Angeles? Uh -huh. And we were like, yes, <laughs> this is a joke. Like we thought it was like a joke. Like uh, this person is going to like take us in their kidnapper van. We'll never be seen again. And they're like, no, 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 it's a thing. He's throwing this Halloween ball. There's opening bands and, but he's headlining and um, we'd love for you to come. We'll give you tickets and you just wander around playing your drums along with the music sometimes when he's playing and we were like great and so we brought our drums in and we were at the show and uh I remember when he walked onto stage like I it was the first time I'd seen him live but I was floored 
at it was the it was the confidence first. It was like I'd never seen someone walk into any situation so in command of themselves and of the room, but with this like it wasn't like with a it wasn't with like an iron fist. It was something there was something delicate about it. He held it really delicately. And that was what was so powerful to me. But it makes me think about what you guys were saying about his um the the performances in the studio and the decisions to you know stay the course and knowing what he knew how to do i know from my experience with recording we enter it with as much confidence as we know how to have but most of the time we don't know what we're doing until we're doing it mm -hmm. you know like we're kind of in the we're figuring out what it is as we're doing it um and i have to assume that there was some of that mm -hmm. as well but because i think all yeah. recording sessions are kind of like that but that confidence that he brings into that not knowing is probably really important and really key does but, that make sense I think, yeah, yeah i think that confidence also comes from his, the the team that he puts together he mm. knows that he's got the people that will give him exactly what he's looking for mm. yeah I, th I think not necessarily right at the beginning when we started hunky dory as i said we we were both very nervous at that point uh, just because mm -hmm. we hadn't done it before but as soon as things started to come together the confidence grew mm. and it continued from there but between i think what what he had control over and how it was coming together and all of that how amazing it was turning out was was one of the things and i, I much as uh I, I hate to say it, but the manager that he had at that time, uh, who shall remain nameless, I will mm -hmm. not use his name, who was, uh, in many respects, was the pits. He, he was mm. uh, he was terrible. He was awful. He mm. ripped he ripped everyone off basically. Mm. But the one thing that he did for David, he he took David. When David started, he should have been just like turning up in a minivan to a, a, a gig and all of that kind of thing. He wasn't. He was turning up in a huge limo. And mm -hmm. so before he even became anything, he was coming in as a star. Mm -hmm. And that helps to give confidence as well, which I, I think yeah. you start to pick up on. <laughs> so there, there was yeah. a bunch of things, I think, that gave David that confidence. But it, obviously it had to come from within. But uh, yeah, yeah. I really wanted to talk about the song Star, um, mostly because it it feels it has that like um, a, a song a song with the in a song kind of idea in that like the thing that's being described is like what I imagine Bowie was reaching for though you do say Ken that he was already like he was a star and was being presented as a star. But the, I like the, there's something that felt like it oddly kind of feels like a Tom Petty song to me in some way, where like, there's like a, a very simple idea of being like, the thing that will be good is me being a rock and roll star. And that's what I'm reaching for when like, of course, that's exactly what he's doing, you know? Yeah. So there's like a moment to me, it's one of the moments where I feel like the closest to Bowie himself, even though there's a lot of characters in the song being described, but like the reality of the fact of being like, my true escape will be stardom, which is such a romantic and interesting idea that, I mean, I, I find that escape, escape in general is always, like, or the escape like through stardom is always just a romantic and tragic thing to talk about all the mm -hmm. time. It's also weirdly prophetic considering um, where our culture writ large sort of took that idea. Mm -hmm. You know, him being such an early adopter of something which is kind of rooted in a radical individualism, you know. I mean, how much of how much of that was him seeing himself and how much of that was a character or a point he was making? I, 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 the whole Ziggy thing was a character. Mm -hmm. and it, it, let's face it. And I, I think it was when the character, when he started to become the character, was when his problems started for a brief period. The, mm. the drugs took in, uh, came in and all of that because he had become Ziggy. Yeah. And that was hard. And he, it, it wasn't him. Mm. He had to get out of that and move into other areas. And uh, so, yeah, they're, they're, I'm, I'm sure that every, every 
every character he played from the Thin White Duke to, to Ziggy to all of the things, they were all part of David. Mm -hmm. it, like he's often described as a chameleon and yes, he was, he would, he could change at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. And one, one of the other things with, with, I'm, I'm not into lyrics, I'm into melody. Uh, so quite often, I don't even know the lyrics of a song that I'm recording. It's, it's one of those things. But the, the classic one for me that just shows where David is sometimes coming from. The last track we recorded for Hunky Dory was a song called The Beauty Brothers. Mm -hmm. David came running into the studio. We, we'd done everything else. He came mm -hmm. running and said, I've just written a new song. We've got to record it. I said, OK. And he said, it's called The Beauty Brothers. Now, it just so happened that Bewley's, or I can't remember if it's just Bewley's or Bewley Brothers, was a tobacconist that was just down the road. Mm -hmm. He'd seen it as he came, he'd seen Bewley as he came in, wrote the song. And he said, but don't listen to the lyrics. And I said, why? And he said, because they don't mean anything. I wrote it specifically for the American market, knowing they would read so many different things into it. <laughs> and I've heard probably nine or 10 different stories as to what Bewley Brothers actually meant and I know David would agree with every single one of them <laughs> so th th he was yeah he he would play games at times and and put things across there that weren't necessarily 100% uh, coach and another thing is Suffragette City one of the tracks on mm. the album there, there is uh I have an interview that he de did in the states with a DJ called Redbeard it was, it, I'm not sure it was his 30th anniversary or four. There was some big show going on at Madison Square Gardens that he was doing. And uh, one of the radio stations over there did this big thing. He did this interview with Ray Beard and they played, uh, they played Suffragette City. And there is a sound in there that it sounds like saxes, baritone mm -hmm. saxes. And Red Beard at the end of it says, and that was David Bowie playing those blaring baritone saxes. And David agreed. It wasn't. It was an art synthesizer. It wasn't <laughs> saxophones at all. <laughs> you could never quite tell when David was being honest and when he wasn't. So, uh, yeah, how that affected his characters as he went on, I don't know. But However you wanted to interpret it, you can precisely. have it that way. <laughs> That's it, yeah. And it is up to you to interpret. The, the, the whole art side of him, uh, the painting and all of that it, it's let's face it art is is up for interpretation it, it's what you see and what you get out of it is the important mm -hmm. thing it doesn't you might see something completely different from the person that painted it or mm. drew it or whatever and but it's how it affects you and i think he was much the same with with his music mm. Mm. he was so dynamic and he, he, you know, just as he changed character, he changed voice and um, having the ability to really be that flexible and really like to croon you, but then to also have so much humor at the same time. Like, I, I think that's what's the most captivating for me as a listener. Um, it never gets tired. You always know it's him, but you never know what's going to come. Um, and I think that's a, that's reflected in literally every part of who he was and what he did, um, both in his voice and um, sonically and visually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the the freedom he has in his voice to be different characters and to like the ad libs and stuff are just sometimes so free and wild and he's not afraid to kind of make a fool of himself and that's what mm -hmm. gives it such energy and um makes it so much fun to listen to um yeah and his use of gang vocals and how vocals are doubled sometimes and not to create these different landscapes you know and since you said he was taking you know or he was using um, first takes oftentimes that makes so much sense that he wasn't precious about oh I've, I've loved a note or something it was really just about the expression of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely one of the things that has always struck me about Bowie's voice was the effortlessness that he seemed to have and you even said it like there seemed to be like a freedom in his voice and I'm particularly struck when I see 
these old performances of him. There's a performance of Starman, you know, we're talking about Starman. And he goes into that first part of the chorus and that big sweeping note uh, in the chorus. And uh, it just feels like it, it didn't cost him anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like so many other singers would have thought about, oh, here comes the big note. And it didn't seem like he was thinking about it. So there's that, which always struck me. And then in the same vein of constantly learning how to sing, <laughs> I uh, every time I've seen Bowie sing and he's like in his stride, it seems as if he's um, lifting and kind of showing his teeth when he sings. And I remember being mm. a kid and really learning how to sing and mm -hmm. seeing him show teeth when he sings. And I've learned that when you're singing as if almost like you're biting into an apple, it sort of mm. arrives a little more effortlessly. And he was always kind of biting into the apple. And so not only the kind of like beautiful kind of mythical metaphor around that, like biting into the apple, but then the literal singing technique of doing the thing was always something that I appreciated from watching him do his thing. I've never heard of now that. Now I'm going to overthink that. I'll be like, am I biting the apple? I'm going to be thinking about that. I think it's like the tipping the head back too. Like how like you see like Stevie Wonder do it all the time. Like when you're like yeah. with the note and you like so yeah. you can. Yeah. But also the lifting of the this and kind of lifting your upper palate and showing uh... your front teeth. It does something. It like creates a um more of a crystalline <laughs> quality Wait a minute. yeah everyone's doing it now <laughs> have fun with i'm not there, i'm not <laughs> sorry <laughs> ken <laughs> okay so what are we going to go on to from here <laughs> <laughs> you got it that was perfect uh, uh, uh just with, with regard to the humor side that was was mentioned you have to remember who a couple of his biggest idols were you, you had uh, Sid from Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. who look at some of the songs that, that he wrote that are very strange and very humorous. He was also very heavily affected by Anthony Newley. Now, mm -hmm. Newley is known more for his musicals that he co-wrote more than anything but uh in his early stages he was more a comedian over here in england he did this mm -hmm. amazing tv series called the strange world of gurney slade which that was t that and and uh a, a, a radio show uh called the goons were the things that completely changed uh british humor and he mm -hmm. he loved tony newley because of gurney slade and then also liked the his vocalizations, how he sang. And he mm. would sound like Newley quite frequently. But mm. uh, that's that's the humor side of it. It, it. it came from these other English acts that he, he was enamored of. Mm -hmm. But uh, mm. no, as, as a performer, as I said, he was, he was amazing. It, it, uh, Rock and Roll Suicide, I think that was the one song I can think of that we, we didn't do all in one take, but it was, it was very much set up that it would be two takes because i wanted the the first half of the song to be very up close and and personal which meant him singing quieter and close to the mic then he belts it out for the end and there was no mm. way i could change everything in time to mm. to get it for that so we did up to a certain point we stopped i reset everything and then he belted for the ending so that one that one was was set up to uh be done in two takes, but everything else, one take, no auto tune, mm. no cut and pasting, no moving around. It was just one performance. I love it. Mm. Yeah. Ken, I'm so glad that you mentioned how, to me, and when I think about Bowie vocally, there's he there's a particular intimacy that I think like he always worked with his engineers to get where it was like one of the first sound and vision included like one of the first times where I was like wow this guy is like he's right here on the mic and there's a feeling of he's there's incredible generosity in it to me where like it's it's true intimacy in that all of a sudden you're like you are he is with you and in a way that is just inspiring to me I can't say about later albums I can say that uh, basically on the ones that, that I worked on, that that was 
that was never considered when he was recording the albums. That's something that, that occurred during the mixing, which he was never at. Hmm. Uh, oh yeah, I said he put together a team and part me being part of the team, he knew what he would get from me. We'd done two albums before. Totally. Tony Visconti producing. So he knew what I could bring to it, left to my own devices. And that was it. It was it, that was amazing. The, the confidence he had in me was was incredible. But it was it was very much. I I have always uh, strived to get depth. Apart from just the stereo spread, I also try and get the depth. Before there was surround sound and all of that, it was it was get a depth using room mics, using reverb and all of that. And so I, I could I could change where he was. Uh, uh, there's a, a track on a land saying called Time, which was the, the second verse, I think it was, where he starts off you and then he says the line. And I wanted that to be kind of there. Then he does it again, you, something else. And I wanted him to be there. So e each time he sang you, I took all the reverb off, which makes it come forward. Then mm. uh, the reverb went back on, which took it back. And that, that's just the kind of things that I've grown up doing, basically. Mm -hmm. it, it's playing with that depth thing, which you, you mm. get from various, various sources. But uh, his backing vocals were brilliant. It, it, there isn't, the, the ideas that he came up with for, for backing vocals were, I, I've never known anyone quite like him for, for some of the ideas that he had. I think it all ca that came more to fruition on pinups. Uh, some of the things he did on that were just outlandish, but all the way through, it's he would come up with different things than I've ever heard anyone else coming up with. He, he, yeah, he was just brilliant. What can one say?